。各位先生、各位女士，我是 Cindy Lu， 欢迎各位参加唐奖第四届大师论坛汉学讲座。由于疫情的关系，唐奖教育基金会举办了一系列的线上论坛。这些论坛让大众有机会真大师。去聆听他们的真知灼见。今天我们非常荣幸邀请到在爱汉学界的大师，那就是王庚武王教授。唐奖第四届大师论坛，我们就会邀请到来自新加坡 ，The President of National Zhengzhi University, Dr. Guo Mingzheng, to give us the opening remarks. Welcome, Dr. Guo. 
which we hope will be the beginning of even more greater, even more meetings of greater minds in the future. As established scholars and rising stars in the field of Sinology will gather here at the NCCU, our university will be a in a position to connect the Chinese culture with the rest of the world. In addition to promoting Chinese studies, we are also actively promoting Austronesian studies. In addition to hosting relevant forums, we are also organizing chair lectures and international credit programs in Austronesian studies. The interaction between Sinology and Austronesian studies is exactly the specialty uh, of President Wong. We are very delighted and honored to have President Wong enlighten us with his speech. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Wong for making this lecture, and thank you for your participation. I hope you will enjoy your time on our campus, and I hope to see you soon again. Thank you. the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, Dr. Xu Huayuan, to say a few words. Welcome, Dr. Xu. Uh, this year, Dr. Wang, recipient of the Tang Prize this year, and President Chen of the Tang Prize Foundation, and President Guo has entrusted our college, the College of Liberal Arts, to host this master's talk, and we are much honored. National Zhengzhi University launched uh, it's Sinology Center two years ago, and of course, the College of Liberal Arts plays a very important role. And because of this, it is our great honor to have the master talks for the Tang Prize in Sinology this year. This is indeed uh, very beneficial and a great honor. Dr. Wang has dedicated himself to studying ethnic overseas, ethnic Chinese. Ethnic Chinese overseas has always played a very important role. And if we look at Taiwan as a diverse and pluralistic cultural uh, site, then ethnic Chinese immigrants and the culture brought by uh, overseas Chinese and ethnic Chinese from all over the world. And I believe that under, based on this premise, because of cultural exchanges and because of uh, this uh, blend, there will be new cultures. In Taiwan, we are blessed with freedom and democracy, especially in the academia. And this has provided us with a unique position that is, which is especially beneficial to academic research. We know that academic research relies on academic freedom. That is the foundation. Unfortunately, in the past, uh, in certain places, uh, the study of Sinology has been obstructed by political uh, obstacles, which has created interruptions in the study of China studies and Sinology. And because of this, Taiwan especially needs to play a more pivotal role in the study of Sinology. 
the Synology Prize under uh, the Tang Prize, of course, would give Taiwan a chance to step up with international trends. Those of us in Taiwan, how can we play out our advantages to play out our strengths based on democracy and freedom? How can we become even more open-minded as we stand firm here in Taiwan and connect with the rest of the world, especially given our place within the context of uh, ethnic Chinese culture? We believe that Chinese culture is very important in Taiwan. And furthermore, through uh, academic uh, environment, we can make sure that the study of Sinology, especially here at National Chengchi University, we can definitely become a heavyweight in Sinology. Today, as we listen to President Wang's speech, this is a very auspicious beginning, and we will continue to work harder towards that end. And we thank Tang Prize for making National Zhengzhi University the venue for this talk today. I wish this lecture every success, and I wish you the best. Let's invite all the guests and participants to take a group photo. Our photographer will take a group photo from the stage. So you may just remain in your seat. Okay, for the first picture, please look at the front. Three, two, one. Okay, let's have one more shot. Please look at the front. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you. Next, let's welcome the moderator of the forum. Dr. Huang Jingxing, Vice President of Academia Seneca, to introduce the 2020 Tang Prize Laureate in Sonology. Welcome, Dr. Huang. Distinguished guest, Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2020 Town Prize Master Forum in Sinology. We are honored to partner with National Zhengzi University to hold this forum, addressing the future of pluralist Sinology. National Zhengzi University is a forerunner in the field of Sinology. Their newly established Luo Jialun International Sinology Chair invites the world's leading sinologists to campus and aims to make National Zhengzi University a global center for research in sinology. Our speaker today is also a pioneer a leader in this field. He is none other than Professor Wang Gengwu. Professor Wang is a current university professor at the National University of Singapore, an academician of Academia Sinica. Some have called him the scholar who helped the West understand China and the new Asia. This year's Tang Prize in Sinology was also awarded to Professor Wang for his trailblazing and dissecting insights on the history of the Chinese world order, Chinese overseas, and Chinese migratory experience. His trailblazing approach passed with pathway with traditional perspective and carved out a new pace that significantly enriched our understanding. His research has filled a gap in the field of Sinology. As a pioneer in this respect, we are honored to have him discuss his thoughts about the field today. Without, without further ado, 
Let's welcome Professor Wang's talk on the high road to pluralist sinology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Huang. Please have your seat. invite you to watch Dr. Wang Geng Wu's speech on the high road to pluralist sonology. I'm very honored to have been awarded the Tang Prize in sonology. This has led me to rethink what my understanding of sonology has been and why I find it difficult to decide who is and who is not a sinologist. The sinology established outside China was based on a European classical approach that developed Orientalist sinology. This became difficult to pin down when Han Xue, it's a Chinese name, was also used by Chinese scholars working outside China. In time, the collaboration between these Western and Chinese scholars, as well as that between various disciplines in the humanities and social sciences, changed that kind of sinology into the larger frame of China studies. Today, a new stage is emerging that uh, is because a rising China is calling on its civilizational heritage to be fused with modern notions of progress uh, to make it a new force in world affairs. But this is a big step forward towards a pluralist sinology that allow us to use the term sinologist to apply to a much larger group of scholars. The idea of pluralism derives from at least four sources. First, the Han Xue sinology covers the total body of knowledge by work by scholars with different cultural and national identities. Second, the foundations have been built on classical Chinese and several other knowledge traditions. Third, the multiple premises used in scholarship are drawn from more than one academic discipline. Fourth, the plurality makes a new sinology useful for China's future development, but may also serve a variety of other political agendas. By going on this high road, the scholars who embrace this much more complex view of sinology are open and inclusive. They are ready to learn new ideas and methodologies in order to extend our knowledge of China and improve our understanding of how a people from an ancient civilization had come to embrace. I shall begin with the first sinologists I encountered. In 1954, when I went to study in London, the top sinologists were all Europeans, with a few Japanese scholars, when some of the Europeans had admitted into their company. I was a mere history student from a colonial university in Singapore that was modeled on those in Britain. There, I did read work by sinologists and was impressed by their ability to extract materials from Chinese sources to reconstruct the history of the lands and peoples between India and China. And that sinology was an extension of the Oriental studies that developed out of classical studies and has served the needs of the European imperial powers. Orientalist sinology, therefore, was based on the study of languages and philological methods. It was holistic in approach towards understanding a once admirable civilization. Sinologists were also knowledgeable about some of the cultures and peoples across the Eurasian continent between Europe and China. Their work covered a variety of texts and material remains that stretched back for millennia. Very few scholars actually entered this field, but the best of them were successful in mastering many of the languages involved. On China itself, Japanese scholars had made their own contributions with Shinangaku, uh, Tudashue, 
And some also joined the Europeans to study North and Central Asia. Chinese scholars, on the other hand, were slow to take the work of outsiders seriously. However, by the 1930s, through the translations of European and Japanese writings by Feng Chengjun and Zhang Qinlang, more Chinese had come to respect the work of some of those Sinologists. The major obstacle to collaboration and mutual respect between Chinese scholars and these Sinologists came from the underlying assumptions in Orientalist Sinology. Unlike for the earlier Jesuits, by the 19th century, the time for wonder at Chinese achievements was over. What replaced that earlier admiration was the focus on the death throes of a remarkable civilization. All these Sinologists became past-oriented, curious how quickly the Chinese culture had become decadent. A few did find Chinese efforts to learn from the West very interesting, while others admired China's legacy of literature and the arts. Yet others were sad that the ancient virtues had failed altogether. They thought that the modern revolutions that convulsed China only brought tragedy for the Chinese people. For most Chinese who accepted the cyclical view of history, Qing China's decline was not surprising. Few at the time thought that their civilization was actually threatened with collapse. Therefore, most Chinese scholars thought that Orientalist Sinology was fundamentally flawed. In contrast, their own China studies, or Kuoxue, was vitally concerned to find lessons from the past to help them deal with new challenges. Their positive approach managed to survive two revolutions and remains important to the present day. Let me now trace the fall of Orientalist Sinology. It had its glorious moment when it was part of the first Orientalist Congress met in Paris, that met in Paris in 1874, and it, that which dominated Western studies of China for over 70 years. After World War II, a new generation met separately as young Sinologists every year. An intriguing moment came at the meeting also in Paris in 1956, when four senior scholars from the People's Republic of China, the PRC, came to participate. That was when a post-colonial consciousness had discredit, discredited the study of Orientals. And not long after, these European Sinologists adopted a new name, the, U, the European Association for Chinese Studies, include, and included the study of modern China. The rise of a new China was what made the difference. The Orientalists were forced to divide between those who concentrated on the textual and philological basis of Sinology, and those who agreed that China studies should be, should welcome the participation of social scientists. This began in the United States in the late 1950s, where the PRC was now seen as part of the enemy in the Cold War struggle for global dominance. New funding was made available to encourage new generation of scholars to study this phenomenon. Also, some scholars, notably anthropologists and modern historians, saw that the Maoists were not mere followers of the Soviet heresy of the West. China was also using its ancient past to redefine its role in the world. And economists and political scientists also began to see that the PRC was not a vassal of the Soviet Union. The Sinologists were thus forced to acknowledge that their field had slipped onto a low road. And if they did not take into account what this China was reconstructing, that would lead them to irrelevance. To avoid that, they needed to recognize that there were alternating breaks and continuities in China's journey from ancient to modern. Some began to see that they could use other methodologies 
to help them extend their scholarly range. Thus, a new cooperative effort that combined Hanshui with the emerging modern China studies was needed. This was a difficult and confusing period. I would like to learn from, about your experiences with this new Hanshui China studies and welcome your inputs. We still need a chronology of the scholarship that began to combine what was evolving inside and outside China between the 1960s and 1990s. I believe there are lessons here in the ups and downs of Sinology. When it was a branch of Oriental studies, it had boosted European belief that their modern achievements had established universal standards for civilization. The world would need to conform to those standards if they want to progress. While there is truth in what the Europeans claim for the scientific revolution and industrial capitalism, their ideological claims had not been acceptable, not in the Islamic realms, nor in Hindu and Buddhist polities. Even for East Asian countries that wanted progress and development, changes were partial and came about with reluctance. China's painful experiences over the past 150 years have shown that studying China requires us to understand why its people today still expect to preserve key parts of their rich heritage. Orientalist Sinology that saw China's past as no longer useful failed to provide that understanding. However, the Hanshu outside China was largely based on the huge body of knowledge that the Chinese scholars themselves had accumulated for at least two millennia. Though Sinology's main contribution was to bring China into the comparative studies of civilizations. The scholars showed in what ways China was different from the Mediterranean civilizations and how Chinese values could be compared to those of India and the nomadic worlds of Central and Northern Asia. By linking the scholarship of ancient civilizations systematically, these sinologists highlighted the distinctive qualities of Chinese civilization. That scholarship had originated from genuine respect for the cultural and organizational achievements of ancient China. Its influence on Europe has been richly captured in the reports by the Jesuits, and more recently in the volumes published by Donald Lach, Asia in the Making of Europe. But the 18th century European Enlightenment and its idea of progress soon reduced that kind of writing to a minor branch of knowledge. In particular, after the McCartney mission to the Manchu Emperor Qianlong in 1793, admiration had turned into exasperation, followed by distrust and condescension, as recounted in Alohimin's 1976 Morrison Lecture, the tradition and prototypes of the China Watcher. Once the imperial powers realized that Qing, power, Qing China was no longer strong and its people were poor and discontented, their attitudes changed. The Qing rulers was then seen as mere oriental potentates ready to be displaced. Once the peoples of such decadent empires were made colonial subjects, the Europeans would gather their artifacts and documents for their museums and libraries. And China's past glories would meet the same fate and would also be stored together with uh, those of defunct ancient civilizations like Egypt, Babylon, Persia, and even greater India. By the end of the 19th century, Western powers expected Chinese ideas and institutions to be replaced altogether by their triumphant universal values. Scholars adopted scientific methods to study state and society, and Sinology no longer had any influence on new developments. Nevertheless, it would be wrong to dismiss the scholarship of the best Sinologists who were open-minded and dispassionate. Some of their work did correct the biases among those foreign leaders 
who prefer China to be weak and ripe to be carved up. Among China's own scholars, there were several false starts in their response to the new challenges. The first was when Chinese students returned from the West, they were critical of past traditions of learning and sought new ways to achieve the progress they wanted for the country. The excitement, the excitement generated among the young after the May 4th movement led to some innovative thinking. A striking example was to decide that China's modern history began with the first opium war in the 1840s. And that way, everything earlier was declared as ancient, feudal, even obsolescent, studied only for the lessons they could teach about what made China's fall inevitable. The second came when a combined civil war and Japanese invasion destroyed the nationalist regime. The efforts to develop a modern Guoxue to compete with Sanolji Hanshue uh, came to nothing. Guoxue was replaced by an ideology-driven rewriting of the past to fit a Marxist-Leninist framework. At this point, even the established Sinologists of the Soviet bloc were suspect and were lucky to be politely received in China. Thereafter, for over 30 years, during the 1950s to 1970s, domestic disputes within and the total rejection of the China studies of the West brought the study of China to a state of confusion. On the one hand, there was increased collaboration between Orientalists and modernists, notably in the United States. Chinese academics working in the West began to work with their Western counterparts, and these scholars exiled to, and those scholars exiled to Hong Kong and Taiwan were actively refreshing their Guoxue heritage in cooperation with these modern Sinologists. On the other hand, there was almost no scholarly work done in the PRC from 1957 to 1978 that is worth anything. Deng Xiaoping's reforms made another start possible. The resumption of academic exchanges enabled PRC scholars to explore the new Hanshui or China studies and focus on the contribution of the social scientists. Others who resumed their work within China resuscitated the Guoxue that had been set aside for decades. There was also some recognition that among the millions of Chinese who had settled abroad, different perspectives about their ancestral homeland had emerged. These Chinese overseas lived and worked among other peoples and cultures and saw different dimensions of what China was and what being Chinese might mean. Perhaps their self-awareness required a different kind of Hanshui or China studies that would meet, make that feel even more pluralist. I'm unable to pinpoint a moment in the 1980s when a pluralist Sinology might have begun. What is clear is that a rising China encouraged a widening of interest, not least by giving more choices to scholars in the PRC. I recall being struck at the conferences organized, organized in the 1980s by scholars in Taiwan and Hong Kong who were willing to call their work Hanshui. And they debated with their counterparts working in Western universities about developing a Chinese Hanshui with the support of those working in the PRC. And some of the PRC seemed keen to work to join them in their venture. Of particular interest to me was the conference in 1991, organized by the Department of Chinese Studies at the National University of Singapore. Here were Chinese scholars in a multicultural nation inviting Chinese scholars from the PRC, Hong Kong, and Taiwan universities to share their experiences with a new kind of Haishui. The location was neither Western nor Chinese. The papers presented were marked by different understandings of what Hanshu could mean. For example, whether Hanshu was an inseparable part of China's studies, 
whether it was distinct from China's own guoxue and should be identified as guoji hanxue, or whether it could be a distinctive field of study that cooperated closely with the new Sinology in the West. It is possible to describe the many ways that China is being studied today. Many ways. It is about an ancient civilization that rose again after a spectacular fall. It is examining how a rising power is challenging Western dominance. It is the study of an exceptional kind of nation state that is ambitious to regain the respect it once enjoyed and do that without making its neighbors fearful of its wealth and power. It is all of the above and more. Now, having to face such differences, getting onto the high road of pluralist synology may be a good step forward. And what does this pluralism mean here? I see three levels of cooperative effort that can draw on the best work done by generations of Sinologists, those of the early Hanxue or Orientalist Sinology, a century of Guoxue scholarship, and a new Sinology that includes the work of social scientists. We know that Orientalist social Sinologists contributed to our knowledge of how China interacted with its multifarious neighbors. In particular, the continental forces that attacked and ruled China as conquerors. Those scholars had shown how non-Chinese sources from other parts of Asia could illuminate many areas of Chinese history. Later, the best washer scholars in China accepted the value of their investigations and in particular, greatly appreciated the archeological skills that these sinologists had introduced into China. Traditional Guoxue scholars like Kang Yuwei were confident and open-minded about what they could do to enable China to become modern. Others like Zhang Binlin were convinced that Chinese value, values were as good as, if not more mature than Western traditions. Yet others were prepared to acknowledge that Japanese Shinagaku did inspire fresh thinking and also thought that some of the Chinese scholars who studied abroad really deserve to be heard. In that context, Guoxue in China emerged as distinct from the Hanxue that Western scholars produced. To Chinese scholars, that Hanxue might have satisfied antiquarian curiosity, but their Guoxue was purposeful, it was rooted in the Jingshu tradition in which scholars worked to make China admirable and secure. Here, the real challenge came from the social scientists. They represented the Euro-American equivalent of the Jingshu tradition and were developed to measure current problems of material progress. By using constantly improving scientific methods, their work would also demonstrate Western achievements to the rest of the world. The Chinese universities established at the end of the 19th century and model on those of the West and Japan, began by insisting that mastery of classical Chinese was essential for any series of study of China. But younger scholars believed that modern science and academic disciplines were necessary for the country's future progress. New subjects like economics, law and administration, sociology, geography, psychology, all became more attractive. And their analytical methods led scholars to conclude that their older holistic tradition was unscientific. And thus the Wenshizhe literature, history, and philosophy pillars of Guoxue were separated. This did not prevent scholars from being as holistic as they wished, uh, but it made it easier for new kinds of cooperation to emerge. And that way, it extended the depth and breadth of Chinese scholarship. What makes it pluralist comes from the many autonomous ways that scholars today can draw on different clusters of skills and insights. Taken together, this enables them to explain and understand 
why or how a modern state connects with its ancient foundations. The methods of classical Han Xue are found to be compatible with those of modern Guo Xue in China. Classical scholarship within and outside China are now familiar with the new methodologies used in the social sciences. That represents considerable progress. However, there is one added dimension to the plurality that is not welcome, but cannot be avoided. A strong and ambitious China is now seen by the global superpower, the United States, as a threat to its supremacy. For both powers, the knowledge gathered by pluralist analogy could serve as a weapon for either self-defense or for intelligent offense under conditions of intense rivalry. In that way, as the large and varied internationalist synologists try to work together, they can see that this high road can also be a dangerous one. They will have to learn how to wield their knowledge, not only to defend the integrity of their profession, but also to help to douse the flames that others have fanned with their inbuilt or policy-determined biases. On this high road, that sensitive and difficult task will always be a severe challenge, but it remains an unshakable responsibility for pluralist sinologists to confront that challenge. Thank you. Thanks for the amazing talk, Dr. Wang. I would also like to take a moment to remind our audience that we'll be taking questions during this panel discussion. If you have any questions you would like to ask, please scan the QR code on the screen or click on the Slido link below the live stream channel. We'll be taking questions through this online platform. Thank you. To begin the panel discussion, let's welcome on stage today's moderator, Dr. Huang Jingxing and panelist Dr. Chen Guodong and Dr. Yang Rei Song. Please take your seat on stage. Thank you, please have your seats. Meanwhile, Professor Wang Geng Wu will also be joining us live from Singapore. Welcome, Dr. Wang. Hi, Professor Wang. Before we begin our panel discussion, let's first welcome Professor Wang who will be joining us live from Singapore. Thank you, Professor Wang, for your insightful talk about the Sinology of the past, present, and present. Your profound analysis of where the fear has been and where it is going set the stage for deeper understanding. During this panel, we will be taking question from the audience. If you have any question you should, you would like to ask, please scan the QR code on the screen or click on the Snido link before the live stream channel. Meanwhile, let me take a moment to introduce our panelists. <clears throat> we are honored to have joining our panel two distinguished scholars who have contributed to the field through their research. <coughs> the first is Professor Chen Guodong, who is a real combination of a scholar who is well versed in both history and economics. And we also have Professor Yang Rui Song, who is currently director of the office of the Jiarun International Sinology Chair 
Luo Jia Lun Synodal Chair. I will first briefly introduce you then, and then ask them to make brief remarks before we start uh, taking your questions. Professor Chen Guodong serves as research fellow at the Institute of History and Philology of Academia Sinica, and was also previously affiliated with the Institute of Economics there. <coughs> he received his PhD from Yale University in 1990, and is a leading expert in Chinese economic history and the maritime history of the Ming Qing period. His research interest centers on the advent of the globalization over the past five centuries. Now, please, Professor Chen Guodong. Dr. Wang, my name is Chen Guodong. First of all, I would like to uh, congratulate you upon receiving this very prestigious award. Sinologists study uh, China and things Chinese. So if we talk about Sinology, it is actually uh, very vast and covers many dimensions. And we thank you so much for your brief overview of Sinology research. Since the Opium War and in the ensuing 100 and 200 years, you gave us a very succinct outline of the development of Sinology. And I am sure that we all learned a lot from your speech following the evolution of Sinology and how Sinology has contributed to uh, the study of history among the different peoples and regions. In the, during the evolution of Sinology because of social and political changes in China as well as global changes, and also the different uh, development of academic disciplines. We have seen changes in the research of Sinology. And therefore, when we talk about Sinology and China studies, it's very difficult to draw a line between the two. And if we look at the traditional disciplines and methodology, as well as the participation of economists, sociologists, and other disciplines entering into the field of Sinology. So Sinology now has become much more diverse and pluralistic with many possibilities. And this is what I have learned uh, from your talk just now. Dr. Wang's uh, speech has been very enlightening, and I have two questions to follow up. My first question for Dr. Wang is Sinology and its relationship to globalization. In the past few decades, apart from the China factor, we're, we have also looked at rapid globalization, which has affected every aspect of human life. And of course, this includes academic study, including the academic study of Sinology. From the perspective of globalization, China's interaction with the outside world, and also how overseas Chinese look at China, these have, these have become um, focus of study for sinologists. The study of overseas Chinese is now uh, part of the diaspora studies. And so the study of overseas China, Chinese, the diasporic uh, Chinese, this is also closely linked to globalization. And also it's related to intercultural uh, comparisons. So as we conduct research, we need to face, we need to explore different languages and different cultures. And there's the issue of um, the ability to master different languages, which is very difficult. Dr. Wang, as a scholar, he has he has been very successful. He also has a wealth of experience, which we would like to invite you to join uh, to share with us later. My second uh, question is with digital development and how it has contributed to uh, scholastic exchanges, creating a big impact. 
Now with digitalization, we can rapidly gain a lot of data for research, and we are seeing massive amounts of data. So how can researchers digest all of this uh, data and information? And the professional uh, researchers and uh, amateur uh, researchers, how do you draw the line? Because uh, it is now very difficult when data is easy, readily available. Re researchers, even amateur researchers, can also come up with very uh, good insights, uh, which cannot be ignored by professional researchers. And this means that uh, the research of the Sinology has become more diverse than ever when we have to listen to all kinds of voices from inside and outside of academia. There will be more research findings. And for someone like Dr. Wang to be able to be very comprehensive in research scope, this will become a more demanding task for researchers all over the world. So we have discovered a phenomenon that is most researchers, they tend to draw a line uh, a draw a line, a boundary to differentiate uh, their research scope, but this could lead to tunnel vision, and the research could become more superficial and not all encompassing and um, holistic. So, I would also like to hear uh, Dr. Wang um, remark on this phenomenon that I have just outlined. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wang. Can you hear us or see us? Will you first respond to Professor Chen Guodong's questions or later collect all the questions, including the second panelist's question remarks? Which do you prefer? I'm, I'm happy to hear. I think I wait to the second comment. I'll take them all together. OK. Now we come to the second panelist, Professor Yang Rui Song who received his PhD from UCLA in 1997. Currently, professor of history at the National Zhengzi University. He also served as vice dean of the College of Liberal Arts and director of the office of Luo Jialun International Sinology Chair. His main research interests include Late imperial and modern Chinese thought and cultural history, as well as psycho history and the historiography. Now, Professor Yang Lei Song. Hi, uh, Wang Jiao Ni Hao. Uh, Dr. Wang and Dr. Huang and Dr. Chen, I'd like to say good afternoon to you all. We just listened to Dr. Wang's presentation within 20 minutes, he gave us a very succinct overview of the development of Sinology, giving us a macro perspective, talking about the high road to pluralist Sinology. The key word would be pluralist. And I think that for Dr. Wang, this is not just a, a descript description of Sinology, but it also has a value attached to which, which is positive uh, value which is uh, attached to this word, pluralist. And after listening to Dr. Wang's presentation, my question is, if we look at pluralist Sinology, would this create some kind of tension between the, a more classical approach to Sinology? Because based on traditional Sinology, there is very often a debate between what is considered to be uh, mainstream and what is considered not to be mainstream. So there will always be a conflict between the interpretation and classification, for example, Han studies and Song uh, studies. And Dr. Yuin Shi also elaborated on this. He was the first uh, sinologist to be awarded the Tang Prize, so I won't elaborate here. According to Wang Yangming, he said that it is very important to be holistic so that uh, all sages will have their own schools of thought, and it's important not to depend heavily on any singular school of thought, but to be comprehensive and holistic. So I paraphrased what uh, Wang Yaming said. So we know that when uh, emperors uh, 
and when there was a coup d'etat, uh, very On the other hand, during the Qing Dynasty, the Kangxi Emperor, he also ordered his officials to uh, rewrite history and to redefine the classics. So there is very often political interference. And now many uh, modernists, there is also a lot of revisions uh, in history. And so, there w so this pluralist sinology will be faced with many challenges. So I'd like to hear from Dr. Wu what he had, what he thinks about this. And my the second point that I would like to mention is, and Dr. Wang's research focuses heavily on overseas Chinese, and he is maybe the topmost scholar in this field. This is very much based on his uh, personal upbringing, because in his work, it has often mentioned that because of his birthplace and also the way that he was brought up. Um, that has affected his uh, research. I also uh, study um, how psychology affects historical interpretation. And we know that it's important. It is often stated that researchers need to be objective. But there's another school which says that researchers must also be aware of their subjective feelings and how their subjective emotions can be can affect their interpretation so that your subjective inclinations serve like antennas so that you can get a unique perspective on what you're uh, doing research on. Uh, Edward Said once said in his work, Orientalism, and he once said, he said that apart from uh, one of the reasons why he wrote Orientalism is because of his personal upbringing. He never forgot the fact that he is an oriental person uh, looking in from the outside. And therefore, his research is very much affected by his personal upbringing, bringing in subjective, uh, subjective interpretation and individual identity and in how this impacts one's research. So Dr. Wong, I would like to ask you, has your personal upbringing affected your research, be it a negative way or in a positive way? If, I have, if you have time, I would very much like to hear what you have to say in regards to this. Thank you. Uh, Professor Wang, uh, we are we are collecting the, all the issue from audience, even from China, Malaysia. So before we summarize all the questions to you, we like you to respond to two panelists first. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the chance to hear your comments about what I said. As you, as you rightly pointed out, it was a very quick survey of uh, all the complex factors that have entered into the, sh uh, the shaping of sinology over the centuries. And uh, the modern challenges are, of course, very new, considerably difficult, much, much more difficult than in the past, and something that we need to really seriously consider. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Chen Go Dong's uh, questions about globalization and uh, the big data, the data analysis that we now face are very relevant to this. Let me let me put it this way. Globalization, it seems to me, can only be good for any kind of study. I mean, that is one of the things we learned about being modern and the kind of progress we've made in the last couple of centuries, uh, led by the West, but now absorbed and accepted more and more by people around the world, that the globalization of our knowledge of everybody around the world has increased our capacity to understand ourselves. I mean, this is a, a tremendously uh, important step forward. But the way we used to be sort of just navel gazing at our own cultures and our own ways of doing things and really treating other people's ways of being irrelevant and inferior uh, is, is now about to pass. I hope it pass. It is certainly not easy. There will always be reluctance to do that. But nevertheless, I think globalization is actually putting tremendous pressure on our capacity to understand people other than ourselves. And, and in that way, also better understand ourselves. And that, to me, that, that uh, 
coming, toing and froing, the, the contacts and relationships, the ability to make com comparative uh, comments on each other's work and so on, he's, he's really enriched uh, uh, the human uh, capacities. So that part, I have no, no hesitation in, in believing that that is extremely important. And the fact that it is plural actually adds to its quality. The more plural it is means that there are more dimensions to, our, to people as human beings. We're not only one kind of human being. All human beings have a tremendous variety of backgrounds, different cultural uh, roots, cultural values. But at heart, basically, we're still human beings. There's the human being, the basic elements that make us human, and all the cultural accretions of centuries of development which pull us apart and make us distinct. And yet at the same time, all that is never really cut off from one another. It used to be less uh, frequent, but now it is so easy. The fact that we can communicate so widely, the fact that we can reach out to the world, gain the latest information from any part of the world almost immediately when it happens, that really, to my mind, enriches our capacities. Of course, it is a challenge because there could be too much. As you say, the data available now is just unbelievably large. And when you talk about the big data, we're talking about millions of new things added every moment of the day, as it were, to, the, to what the world has to, has to learn. And it is obviously not possible for us to grasp all of that. That is a major challenge. And I think we, we have no, there's no, no way we can get around it. What I think Synology can do is an example of it anyway. The way the Synologists have developed their capacity to increase their range of knowledge over the years, the way they've accepted the new methods to be used to improve their old methods of understanding the world illustrates the human capacity to learn and to kind of acquire new skills as the, these skills are put before us. Uh, when they, make, when they make, uh, make, make us realize they are necessary, that we have to master them, we show that we can and we have the capacity to do that. I think to me that is very encouraging, extremely positive. It means that being plural and being global at the same time is highly enriching. We never knew how plural we were until we became global. The more global we are, the more we realize there is no one single answer to everything. For example, one of the major questions in my mind that the pluralism of a globalized world has done is to challenge the very idea of universal values. It's one of the contradictions uh, that uh, one has to face. On the one hand, we are looking for universal values that are common to all of mankind, as it were, all of us must share. I think that's a very good idea and it's something that we should pursue. But at the same time, we are shown by the very fact of globalization how plural we all are and how impossible it is to simply say we have found the universal value for all time and everybody else must conform to this, otherwise you're not civilized and you're not going to make any progress. I think that challenge itself comes from globalization and comes from the plurality of all the peoples that are now made available to, to everybody. So that's my, my little answer to, to, to your very profound question. As for Professor Young's uh, questions, I think, uh, again, you, you ask about pluralism. Yes, well, yeah, as you can see, I, I am very positive about pluralism. I, I'm not really afraid of it. I, I didn't know how plural the world was when I was young. I thought it was much simpler. I was born Chinese, brought up Chinese, and I thought being Chinese was everything that mattered. Everything else was sort of uh, less important. But I've learned over, the, over these decades, and as I read more and learn more about the globe as we globalize, and as we recognize the plurality at all levels of human behavior, both past and present, and when we put them all together, my goodness, the richness that is available there. How can one not be positive about learning from all that? There, there's so much to learn. And in that sense, all the possible contradictions between what is classical and modern, what is mainstream and what is not, and so on, these are continual debates. There will always be debates. 
And that is quite healthy. That's the way we learn. We challenge each other. We say that is, that is out of, that's classical. That is, that's no longer really terribly important. What is important is what is mainstream and absolutely up to date, the current development. We can say that this is perfectly normal and the debates should continue. In fact, they're part and parcel of our learning process. So I'm not at all afraid of that. Even the question of being holistic, you want to be highly specialized? Yes, you need to be highly specialized to really get at some of the more difficult issues that cannot be done superficially. And yet at the same time, we know that if you pursue that too far, you completely lose sight of where we're going. So you do need to have people to do both. If not one person can do them both, probably, that's, that's fine. There are people who do more of one or the other, but there will have to be, every now and again, time given to people who are capable of drawing upon the specialized knowledge and thinking largely, holistically, of how this, what this means to us as human beings uh, in, in, a, in a globalized world with all the pluralist origins that we, we, have, we come from. So I would say, yes, there are a great deal of difficulties with all this pluralism, with all these challenging debates and dis dis disagreements and even, even conflict arising from uh, such uh, misunderstandings and so on. But this is where I think the scholar comes in. And a sinologist is just one particular branch of scholarship. The scholar's responsibility in the end is to say, I need to use my skills to enable us to differentiate those matters which are temporary and are passing and just a fad for a while, and those which have lasting importance and will always be there and always challenge the best people amongst us to find better solutions. They may never find the final solution. There, is, there may be never be a final answer. But the constant search for answers is what the scholars are about. And it seems to me that in that context, the scholars' responsibilities in the face of all these various debates and challenges is, remains very, part, very important. In fact, I would say, as a scholar myself, at least I try to be, to be, this is paramount. This is our responsibility, that we go on seeking to see what are the way, better, what are better ways of understanding the many, many debates that are going on. So your final question also is related to this, of course. Objectivity and subjectivity is a major philosophical question, and I have no, I'm not a philosopher, I can't get enter into the difficult realms that, that, uh, that uh, we lead us into. But I would say that, of course we are subjective. I mean, all knowledge, comes from some subjective instinct to respond to a question, a way of asking a question, a way of avoiding certain answers, the way of a way we like certain answers better than others, all these are subjective. And they are influenced by our upbringing, and you're right about child psychology, our upbringing, what we learn from, what, from young and so on. All these things are basic. But there is a responsibility that in the course of learning, you continually try to sift between what you recognize to be subjective and coming from your feelings in your personal response to things and those which are not, which are actually sub separate from how we feel, but, be, but they are there. They have to be recognized and respected because they are true or they're statements of fact. They are data which we cannot deny. As long as in our own minds we are clear what is subjective and is what is objective, I don't think we, there's any harm to recognize or to admit that we are subjective in a lot of what we do, but the effort to be objective, the mental challenge, the mental struggle with the problems of objectivity is a major contribution to knowledge. That's how we get to know. But all that time, we must always be honest and frank in admitting what we know to be subjective and what we think are not. At least if we can distinguish that in our own minds, I think it'll make us better scholars. Now that capacity to be able to tell where we come in as subjective uh, participants, as it were. I, I found, I learned a lot of this from the anthropologist, actually. The observer participant 
Uh, I, before that, as a historian, I always thought there was something that is objective because we can look at archives, look at the documents, and everything is known, and you cannot challenge that. I, I was quite simple-minded about that. But having talked and re read a lot of work by the anthropologists and people with similar fields, and psychologists as well, I realized that the observer-participant role, which is very, very difficult and requires a lot of sensitivity and self-knowledge, is extremely enlightening if you understand and have experienced that, then you realize also at the same time what you're doing. You are subjective in observing what is happening, but you're at the same time trying desperately to understand what is the objective part of the person or the group or the society or the tribe or whatever it is that you're studying. It has its objective reality which you must separate yourself from. And that skill is something that is very hard to master. I don't, I don't claim to be that skilled in doing that, but I do, I think, believe that I have honestly tried always to try and determine what is subjective and find out what is subjective and distinguish that from what is in, in irrefutable facts and data. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Professor Wang. Uh, in view of so many questions and responses from global audience, Professor Wang's talk must be very successful and inspiring because time is limited. So I cannot uh, ask you to answer all the questions. I will pick up three from Taiwan, five from overseas. Overseas means outside Taiwan from Malaysia, Singapore, or China, okay? So I, I will go to the first one from Taiwan. The, the audience named Peter, his question is as follows. What future interdisciplinary trends do you foresee for the field of sinology? That's the first one. Repeat that, please. I didn't quite hear the beginning of that. Uh, I speak as slow as I can. What the future interdisciplinary trends do you foresee for the field of sinology? That's the first one. That's it. Do I answer straight away or do I wait for other questions? Because I answer. they are so different. So perhaps uh, you better answer one by one. Otherwise, we okay. are you know, confused. Okay, let me try that. Uh, I think the world now recognizes that the emphasis upon academic discipline, highly specialized skills and so on, has done its job. That, that world has done its job. It's made us alert to what is disciplinary, what is necessary to make sure that our skills are honed to the finest possible refinement to get, the, to get at the truth. We now also recognize that going deep into knowledge can lead us into labyrinths of where there's no return. You just get lost in the vast amount of possibilities that as the deeper you go. I remember being impressed by my scientist friends, the physicists, who sort of, the way he worked, the more he de went deeper into what he wanted to know, learn about the core of the universe, the more distant, either in astronomical terms, or more minute the kind of elements are involved in trying to find out what is the, the basic one simple element of that made that is the beginning of the hours. So that deep knowledge that is necessary completely takes him out of range of anything else he can do or he can cover. That, that is, that's how I took it. So what I've learned is that you need to be specialized about some things. You must know something deeply. You must be aware what are the possibilities. But for most of us, what we need to know is what does all this add up to? How does, how does it affect our lives? How does it affect the future of the world? And efforts must be made to try every now and then to pull back and say, hang on, 
we've got that far, what does all this mean? And we did, then we re realized we need people to actually have some interdisciplinary capacities. How you get that is not easy. Everybody will arrive is a different set of interdisciplinary skills. But if enough people give enough energy and time to spend on the ways and means in which you cross disciplines to better understand your own field, then that contribution, that kind of debate and discussion among people who are willing to cross disciplines, I think greatly enriches our capacity to learn about the real world. So interdisciplinary, there's no one set of disciplines that you must master. It depends on what your question is, depends on what you really want to know, and to what your knowledge is meant to do. What do you want that knowledge for? When you know that, then you will find the necessary interdisciplinary fo focuses that you need to get at the best possible answers for what you want. So to that extent, it reminds us how knowledge is very pliable. It's not just one simple set of things that you can pinpoint, and once you know that, it's done. It's continually dynamic, actively changing in, in, in its perspective as our understanding and our, as our questions become more complicated and sophisticated. As the things we want to know involves wider variety of experiences, then you have to seek different disciplines to try and answer your question. So interdisciplinary itself is something that depends on your capacity to bring whichever disciplines you absolutely need to understand, to answer your questions. Uh, to my mind, there is no simple way. We all have to be interdisciplinary at some point in our lives. And that point, we choose the kind of, we decide the kind of disciplines that Sinology would need, for example. To understand China today is a very much more complex question than it was 200 years ago. And now it's a China in a world which is globalized, as Dr. Chen reminds us. And that globalized world means that we're dealing with hundreds of nations, different kinds of uh, economic problems of a range from the richest capitalist countries to the poorest in agricultural pastoral countries. And the range is so great. How can you pick any set of uh, disciplines? So Sinology is only one example. When we do it for China, we look at a China that is so complex, it demands a tremendous range, ranging from basic simple things about how to make how to make people less poor and less unhappy and less uh, 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 unhealthy to those which require the technological skills of taking China into another cyberspace world, which, which we don't fully see yet, but which is so demanding and so exciting to the young people that they want to reach out to a universe well beyond. So Sinologists in the study of China must include all those people in China who range in their interests from one to the other. And I don't think there's any single set of interdisciplines that would solve that problem. Thank you, Professor Wang. I think the second question is related to the first one, but I would read it as follows for you. Many say that the Sinology is a field where scholars work as individuals are they whales? Are they whales? Where scholar can work as a team? I think you have always answered it. So I go to the third question from Taiwan. Looking back on your very successful career, could you share your own experience in shaping this pluralist sinology, both within and beyond China? Well, I, my range is very, quite limited compared to many others. But because I grew up outside China, and because I still remain extremely fascinated by, by Chinese history and where Chinese history has taken the Chinese people to uh, today and what it uh, might become in the future, uh, that, that question in my mind has led me to look at certain kinds of, of uh, questions more than others. And for example, um, I've seen Chinese people settle in different parts of the world 
and become very different people in the course of settling and in the course of adapting themselves to different circumstances. And that to me, it to begin with, was very surprising because I grew up believing that Chinese would be the same anywhere. They go anywhere, they'll always be Chinese, they'll always be eating the same food, think the same way, have the same moral values, and, say, and like the same things, have the same artistic uh, skills, and so on. Until I realized that this is not uh, that simple. Uh, the more I traveled, the more I met, met, and wherever I traveled, when I would meet with Chinese communities in different parts of the world, some of them have been there for hundreds of years, some of them have been there for only for a few decades, but even then, no matter how long they have been, they have changed. They could change because they respond to new circumstances, and to me, that capacity to respond, to adapt, to rethink and reframe the, the values in their own lives is amazing. The variety is just absolutely amazing. Uh, I remember being struck by the fact that, uh, for example, in some remote island somewhere in the, in the South Pacific, I will meet a community of Chinese who've been there for several generations. And on the one hand, they are still recognizably Chinese. On the other hand, they are totally at home among the, the peoples, whether they're Polynesians or Melanesians, and they've become very much adapted to their way of life and are capable of, of moving back and forth in, in a ways which I was utterly astonished to learn and what we are capable of. So that enrichment of my understanding of what is Chinese has been, my, to me, the most satisfying thing in my life, to realize that being Chinese is not being some narrow, simple-minded way of looking at the world. Being Chinese simply allows us because of our bringing and our capacities that in our background allows us to re realize how, what, why, how wide-ranging things can be. Take one example, very, to me, very important example. Most of the scholars I meet who come out of China carry with them the seeds of the most profound philosophies that the Chinese thinkers of the past 2,000 years, 3,000 years have refined to a point when it is extremely important to them as the core of Chinese moral philosophical values. And yet at the same time, you meet Chinese who come from different groups, who don't have that kind of background, but who in fact uh, represent the majority of the Chinese people, and who, who spread around the world and bring their customs from their local towns, their religions, their, their faith, their understanding of what is their gods, they bring abroad the loyalties to their family, to their hometowns and to villages, the loyalties that they kind of accept, which have almost no bearing, no direct relationship with the high, high Chinese culture that the philosophers talk about. And yet, are they not Chinese? They're all Chinese. There are a tremendous variety of them. And not only that, then you realize that within China itself, when there are many, many people on the edges of, of China who are part Chinese and not, part not Chinese, all the various Shaoshu Minzu, the minority peoples in the southwest or northwest of, of China, and how they relate to the Chinese. And then you realize how subtle these, these relationships are. It's not, there's no simple Chinese-ness that you can say that is Chinese and that is not. You realize that even within China, the fact that all these people have share some things and do not share other things, and yet they all belong to a same, a kind of cultural complex, which is wide ranging. And this, even among the Han Chinese, there's so much variety between northerners, southerners, and different parts of different provinces and so on, which makes us realize the dimensions of what we say is Chinese. And what, that is why I say Sinology is much richer than we used to know it to be. The dimensions of it is just enormous. And what we can learn by opening our minds to the fact that there's so much variety and so much flexibility and adaptability among people that the field of Sinology becomes really, in a way, another branch of the study of the human race, of the human beings as, 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 a, as, a, as a special kind of animal on this earth, so to speak. Thank you, Professor Wang for having shared uh, your wonderful intellectual experience with Sinology. 
Now the following two questions raised, uh, I pick up from China. So you might respond in Chinese or English as you wish. The first one from Peking University. First question is from Beijing University. Uh, Professor Wang, my question is related to the definition of China. Recent years in China, we have seen that China as a concept, has it has been discussed over and over. From reality, China is undoubtedly, it includes Xinjiang and Tibet. However, if we look at the differences, Xinjiang and Tibet, they are very different from the Chineseness that we discuss in our daily lives. So how do you regard uh, the Chineseness of Tibet and Xinjiang? Is there a better uh, train of thought uh, to explain this difference between Chinese? <laughs> this is a very difficult topic to talk about. How can you define what constitutes China and Chineseness? If we do you adopt the geographical definition of what is China or what is recognized internationally as what belongs to China or is a part of China? How do foreigners look at China? And what is China in the minds of the Chinese. This is very difficult to define. What is meant by China? Historically, what, are we talking about the empire of China? Because the Chinese empire and its territories and its geographical boundaries have changed over the uh, dynasties, and if we talk about uh, sovereignty, what the sovereign boundaries and the cultural boundaries are very diff are very different. So, traditionally, you might say that China is the uh, would refer to the chi the Chinese would refer to the people in China who are under the influence of Chinese culture, those who recognize and fully accept. Chinese civilization and claiming to be of the same ancestry, uh, would this be uh, one way to define what constitutes China and the Chinese? But looking at the global situation, uh, or looking at a lot of uh, variations, a lot of differences, if we look at, if you, go, if, if you visit the tomb of the uh, emperors of um, past dynasties. How would you uh, respond? The Huangdi, uh, em the uh, burial site of the uh, Huangdi, the yellow emperor, or even the concept of Tianxia. Since a child, I've been hearing the saying, uh, Tianxia refers to the entire world or the entire Chinese world. And if you refer to Tianxia, you're referring to the whole world or the whole of China. So this is a very ambiguous term. People have asked me, are you Chinese? Uh, and I have started to use Huaren to define myself as an ethnic Chinese. So as a Chinese person or as an ethnic Chinese, ethnic Chinese. In English, you are Chinese. 
but we have Hua Ren and uh, Zhong Guo Ren, uh, both translated into English would be on uh, Chinese. So it's very ambiguous. So do you consider yourself to be a Hua Ren, mean, meaning you're ethnic Chinese? So if you're ethnic Chinese, are you not Chinese? So where do you draw the line between Chinese and ethnic Chinese? Or do you, if you talk about all the people coming from within the boundaries of China, then you would be Chinese. Then those, how would you refer to uh, overseas Chinese? Or do you look at this person who was defined as Chinese based on your blood or your, or, or your cultural background? And there are Han Chinese. And in China, there is a definition for Han Chinese. I would call myself Han Chinese, but of Many of my friends, they are not uh, ethnically Han. They might be Muslim. Would that, so are they, would they be considered to be Chinese? And of the different, there are five different peoples who would fall under the umbrella term of um, Chinese. So how do you differentiate the different peoples? So are we referring to the geographical boundaries or are we referring to the cultural boundaries? So if we refer to the geographical boundaries, then the Tibetan and the Xinjiang people would also be considered to be Chinese. But they are not uh, culturally Chinese. They would refer to themselves as, if they are overseas, they would refer to themselves as Tibetan or uh, uh, from Xinjiang or a Tibetan in China, a Tibetan um, um, in China. So again, uh, we can talk about subjectivity. There are many subjective interpretations. And there's another concept which I have written about before. We have multiple identities. So if you were to ask me how I identify myself, it would really depend on the context in which this question is asked. So there are different considerations. I consider myself Chinese, ethnic Chinese, and also I belong to the Han people. I, I, I belong to a certain nationality. I'm also from the province of Jiangsu, but uh, my nationality, Singaporean. So we all have multiple identities. So there is no single identity for any single person. So this is my response. The second question also comes from China, uh, from Fudan University in Shanghai, Professor Wang. Good afternoon. We know that the rise of China has a lot to do with the Cold War. It seems that a new Cold War is in the making. So my question is, do you think the new Cold War, how will the new Cold War impact the new Sinology? What will be the new directions in which Sinology uh, develops in the future? Another tough question. Um, first of all, I'm not sure it is a Cold War. If you, if you mean by Cold War, the kind of ideological difference, the ideological gulf, as it were, between what uh, Soviet communism stood for and what liberal capitalism stood for during the 40 years of the Cold War. That was fairly clear cut. Because as you say, the capitalists believed that communism would fail. The communist leaders actually said, we will crush capitalism. And they actually believed that. They would destroy capitalism because it's only a phase of history. Communism must ultimately win over capitalism. Now that was actually very easy to understand because it was couched in black and white terms. And Cold War in that context, because it was an ideological war, it was a Cold War because it was not a war that required any resort to force. The kind of hot war that you needed to settle specific issues cannot settle a historical question as to whether 
capitalism would be crushed by communism. It's not, a, it's not, it's not that simple. It's much, much more uh, profound and larger issue. So that Cold War, I think, has a special context. Today, what I think is so difficult to understand is that we're actually facing two kinds of capitalism. I don't believe there is an ideological war between communism and capitalism. I believe that they are now, we are all now capitalists, whether we like it or not. I actually, I actually have grave doubts about being, a cap, being called a capitalist or being thought of as a capitalist. But I, I think we can't escape from the fact that the global economy that we talk about, just now globalization, is actually based now on the capitalist economy. And ultimately, that's what it, what it boils down to. So we have basically one economic system, but managed differently and handled differently with different methods of making use of the capitalist and industrial technology that is evolving all the time, constantly challenging us to make good use of it. But at the same time, we are also facing the fact that we are all seeking the same goal. We all, at least the, the people who are competing, are asking for improvement in material, in material wealth, in the growth of uh, people's uh, 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 well-being, better health, better education, higher standards of living, um, a middle class spread across the world, growing everywhere, and ultimately a world which will be where people will be more and more alike, at least in terms of their material well-being and health and so on. So that, that's what we're talking about. And we think that the capitalist methods that are now providing that kind of economic growth that are meeting some of the difficulties that people could not solve from, for centuries in the past are now being solved. The way poverty is being reduced over the last few decades is really extraordinary. Now, whether we can still continue with that if we stop globalizing, if, if the pandemic, for example, and the kind of retreat from globalization happens, and that would be very worrying. So, in fact, right now, to me, what worries me much more than the idea of a Cold War is the fact that some people want to pull away from globalization and others want globalization to continue. And why they do that, one, in terms of more active governmental participation in the economy, and the other side asking for less government and more freedom given to the private enterprise that is the heart of the kind of capitalism that has been so successful in the past. Now, these are very different levels of debate and discussion. And it, to me, that is not what I mean by Cold War. If you, if you like, again, call it a different kind of Cold War because you, you can still avoid uh, a, a physical conflict. But I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure that this is, because when it comes to capitalist competition and when it comes to economic competition, competition over sea lanes, communication networks, technological cyberspace hacking and all these other things, they could actually lead to much more conflict than a Cold War of the ideological kind. So in a way, it is much more dangerous than the Cold War because this is about real problems. People's wealth, people's security, people's sense of prominence, dominance, and supremacy, all these things are being challenged in a way which the ideological war wasn't really concentrated on these issues. Today, this is something real. And the capacity of, say, the two so-called superpowers now, the capacity, economic, industrial, and uh, technological capacity of both those countries are actually up up for grabs, as it were. That's the, these are the stakes that are at issue. And these stakes cannot be so simply dealt with like ideology can be in the abstraction, but this involves actually co direct competition and rivalry, and these rivalries can express themselves in physical form. Thank you, Professor Wang. The next question from Australia. Uh, in past years, PRC's Confucius Institute gave rise to strong criticism and debates. How do you evaluate impacts of the Confucius Institute on Han Xue? Oh. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that the Confucius Institute 
and I'm sure has any connection. <laughs> I think they are quite separate things. The Confucius Institute was actually, to my mind, uh, an attempt to, to learn from or copy what the West used to do, whether it's called the USIS or British Council, Goethe Institute, and the other different countries, the French have it also. And they are meant to provide, as it were, cultural interactions and to provide uh, a cultural uh, way of introducing the culture of your country to another country in order to, to improve friendship and understanding and, uh, and therefore gain influence and uh, in, in a way, an extension of soft power. And I think the Chinese were very impressed with that. They were directly modeling themselves on one of the most successful British Council, I think, or, or the Goethe Institute, very successful. And I think they started that way, and there was a demand. And the demand came from the fact that there were lots of people who wanted to learn Chinese. The language demand, as far as I can understand it, was very universal. Almost everywhere, people who wanted to learn Chinese found it very difficult to do so in, in many parts of the world. So the Chinese got the idea that they would supply the, uh, the Chinese teachers. So I think the, the beginnings were actually quite straightforward. But what has happened is that now it is associated with something much bigger. In fact, to, to, coming back to the question of uh, competition and rivalry between two kinds of capitalism and uh, one, one one side saying that's not the way to do it, and the other side saying that's the only way we know how to do it. If we don't do it this way, we can't succeed. Or, and these are the arguments. And within that argument, there are also accusations of hacking, cyber uh, use of uh, use of cyber methods to to uh, steal technical technical skills, scientific. Uh, technologies and so on, methodologies, and therefore part of a technological challenge in, in, the, in the world to come. And at and, and the same time, the, when you talk about soft power influencing people, uh, unlike the, the Western one, which was, came very self softly over 100, 120, 150 years or so, in the form of a very indirect form of influencing to just simple superiority of wealth and power for a long time uh, became part and parcel of our heritage so that people didn't even notice it. That's why it was called soft power. But the Chinese didn't have that. The Chinese are doing it rather quickly over a short period of time in the last 20 or 30 years, trying to sort of speed up the influence of, uh, of their soft power to try language and and, uh, and meeting the demands of people who need the skills and need the development which the Chinese believe that they can offer. All these have led the Chinese people to move faster than normal. And in faster than normal, in the context of being seen as rivalry, as being challenging to what is already there. So those who are in positions of dominance, who feel that the challenge is against their dominance, and this challenge will be at their expense, and that in this zero-sum game kind of rivalry, then the only way to treat them with great suspicion, that I think has crept up. So the Confucius Institute, I think, is one of the victims of that. To me, it, uh, it may do some strange things, but I think it's a really basically harmless little thing. And, uh, and what has happened is that it's been politicized in a very intense contest for supremacy in my, as part of that. And uh, it's been a victim, as it were, of its own uh, impatience. Thank you, Professor Wang. Perhaps because you were born in Malaysia, so I'm we born collect... I'm born in Indonesia. Not Malaysia. Professor, as I remember, am I correct? You live in Malaysia, ma? No, no. I'm in I was born in Indonesia, not in Malaysia. Well, sorry, my mistake. Uh, we have received many questions from Malaysia. I'm going to pick two to three of them. Here's one. Citizenship, ethnic 
minority was the submission to the rule by another Malay majority race, remembering the alien rule of China. I'm not sure I got that question. I think, could you say, repeat that, please? Ta, uh, by acquiring Malaysian citizenship as ethnic minority, I think the person who raised question was, it means was the submission to the rule by another Malay majority race, resembling the alien rule of China, Qing. That's his question, or her question, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not sure, I, can, I know how that analogy could be made. I'm not sure it has any similarity. I mean, the Qing, Qing China is a conquest dynasty. I mean, the Manchus actually conquered the whole of China. In the case of uh, Malaysia, it was a, a, a nation that was artificially created after British protected protection and the British col colonies of, uh, of that Malay Peninsula area is really created by the British out of uh, several Malay states and, uh, and with a lot of migrant people from China and India who had come in, were brought in by the British for economic and commercial reasons. So the circumstances are, to me, nothing comparable to what uh, Qing China was. Uh, this is something quite different. Mm. In the Qing China, uh, as you, as everybody has noted, uh, after conquering China and ruling China for over 250 years, they actually became more and more Chinese. Uh, the, the British did not do that. They, they ruled, they had a good time, they took what they wanted, made a lot of money, and then they all went home mm -hmm. to eat. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. Another question also from Manasseh. The question is coined in Chinese. Compared to uh, European Sinology, the Sinology in Southeast Asia seems to be uh, relatively weak. Uh, based on your perspective, the Sinology studies in Southeast Asia, what are some of the characteristics of Sinology in Southeast Asia, and how can uh, Sinology in Southeast Asia carve out its, no, its own niche, especially as it examines uh, globalization. The Sinology that is evolving among the Chinese in, say, Malaysia can be compared to that of Europe. In Europe, because it, it really sprang out of their own classical scholarship tradition and it had its own roots in the way they studied uh, foreign people and also related to their imperial needs when they studied these natives in order to, to help them rule over these natives. So that had a different, different context. Where the Chinese, uh, for example, in Malaysia are concerned, they had two kinds of uh, uh, challenges. One was for a long while, they were adapting very well to the local conditions they were studying the local languages, they knew a lot about local customs, they understood about their religions, and while they were practicing their own, they were able to distinguish between the two and manage to bring about this considerable harmony between among the people they live with. What happened was when they wanted to, when they became part of a nationalist China after the, in the beginning of the 20th century, and they wanted to be more and more, more Chinese and less Southeast Asian, so to speak. They then measured their Chinology by what the Chinese scholars were doing in China. And of course, by that standard, they were a long way away. They had to study Chinese. In fact, a lot of the problems were they, they didn't really have a, a, a very easy way to deal, deal with that because the, the kind of classical tradition was never really brought to Southeast Asia at that stage. The Chinese schools that were set up in, at the 20th century were really modern schools, uh, were set up like modern schools in China. And they did not emphasize classical learning at all, no linkage with the Han Xue or Li Xue or any of the old traditions that uh, you can think of. But in fact, if anything, the, the Southeast Asian Chinese were trying to catch up with 
the modern Chinese of the post May 4th tradition, their literature, their polit politics, the nationalist politics of Sun Yat-sen and the Kuomintang in the early stages, and, in ca and carrying forward to try and do as well as, be as good as the scholars in China. That's the highest ambition they had for a while. But that was one phase. At the meantime, there were always other Chinese who felt that that was not possible anyway. And it was probably not very meaningful to their lives in, in, in Malaysia. So they continued to adapt to the local conditions. And of course, they adapt in various ways. And they have come later on, and the, the Sinologists amongst them had come by studying both the Chinese Sinology and the Sinology of the West. They have now, they're now open to both sides. So how good they are, we're still early to say, because they're a very young generation of scholars. Only in the last, I would say, 40 or 50 years have they had a chance to build up something which is a bringing together of what, in fact, that, that conference I mentioned in Singapore, a kind of guoji hai shui, a guoji hai shui in which Chinese and non-Chinese can together work together to work on China, to understand China better, but with a wide variety of of, of uh, starting points and recognizing the, the cultural uh, differences and different premises that you start out with, but not no longer trying just to be as good as those scholars in China or elsewhere, but to be as good as the best scholars you can become in your own country, whatever that may be, Malaysia or Singapore or Indonesia and so on, to try and do that. And of course, in some countries, you can't do that. Those countries don't encourage it, don't allow it, and in fact, there's no, virtually no Chinese work being done. But the countries that do still allow it and do, in fact, still encourage it, I think there, there at least there are some opportunities for some at least new ways of looking at it. For example, the kind of scholarship there is not so much about classical scholarship. You cannot compete with the work done in Taiwan or, on, or in, in the PRC and so on, because their, their, their work will be based on what they know of Chinese customs the local customs, the ordinary popular religions, popular faith, the kind of gods they, they, they respect. In fact, very much drawing upon the anthropological, sociological uh, research that, uh, the, uh, even psychological research that is now creating a new kind of awareness of a different level of Chineseness that had nothing to do or not much to do with the classical learning of the greatest scholars of China. So that something else is happening. How good it is, I think it'll take a little time before we can tell. All right, now it comes to the last question from a person named Kuo Sida. I don't know where she or he comes from. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for your wonderful presentation. I would like to ask Dr. Wang, have you read Professor Shi Shu Mei written about the diaspora uh, of um, overseas Chinese? That is based on the premise of diaspora with foreign consciousnesses and the present ongoing localization and the necessity uh, which is runs counter to uh, the theory of diaspora. So this counter diaspora approach, how does that uh, find its place within the study of Sinology? I have got a record to say that I have difficulty with diaspora. I have objected to it being used so loosely about the Chinese. Of course, there are Chinese who are diasporic, but I would argue that most Chinese prior to the last few decades, the new, the new Xin Yimin may be a bit different, but all those Chinese who had been settled around the world before the 1980s, uh, I don't think the proportion of them that are dry diasporic is that high. And many of them have really settled down and come to terms with the different lives that they have to live and, and in fact, adapted very rapidly and very fully, I would say, to different circumstances. And therefore, 
to use the word diaspora to describe all these Chinese scattered around the world, I think is terribly misleading. So that's my problem with the word diaspora. I know Shi Mei is, uh, is a, she's a very sophisticated scholar, she's excellent, and she, of course, concentrates on a somewhat different approach. When she talks about the Sinosphere, uh, I think the, the, you know, it's a kind of language, the language range, which I think has tremendous promise. That's a different thing from diasporic to my mind. That is the fact that we share certain uh, language features, uh, not necessarily from Pudonghua or specifically from Pudonghua. It could be from the dialects, from the different language, uh, different dialects that the people went out from China with and still keep up, keep going. And some of these ways of communicating among themselves, even as they settle elsewhere and they pick up other languages, they in influence the Chinese that they use. So the Chinese language has spread out uh, the way it has over the last 150 to 200 years itself has created a, a different world, which is not the same and cannot be directly compared with what is happening in China. So it, in that sense, it is not diasporic. It has a certain features of its own and it has a life of its own, it, it seems to me. And the potential is still quite great. And yet, because they have some co common features, these people can communicate with each other transnationally. They're not limited by national boundaries. They can do so in, in business, in commerce, in art, in a, a number of other forms. In other words, it doesn't have to be anything to do with the governments or anything to do with the state. It is private. It is entrepreneurial. It is adventurous. It is uh, uh, willing to to reach out, as it were, a kind of openness to one another. And it has tremendous possible interest, tremendous interesting, this sinosphere, as it were, of, uh, of commonalities in certain customs, certain foods, certain uh, language habits and, and affecting their thinking. All these things, they can still enable these people to communicate with one another outside of China is itself, I think, a phenomenon worth very serious study. Thank you, Professor Wang, for your wonderful answers. Because time is limited, I have to apologize for those who has raised the question, but uh, I didn't pick it out. So perhaps we still have other occasions to engage such dialogues. Thank you so much, Professor Wang for your Thank wonderful you. insight for the talk. We are all learning a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, professors. The 2020 Master Forums has now come to an end. Thank you for joining us today here. We wish you all a good day. 谢谢主持人及各位语坛人精彩的观点。第四届唐奖大师论坛汉学场到此。This concludes the 2020 Tang Prize Masters Forum. Please remember to return your headsets to the front desk and thank you so much for your participation. We wish you a good day.